Welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Holly Kunsicki. She completed her medical school training at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, an internal medicine residency here at Mount Sinai Hospital, followed by an integrated fellowship in nephrology and palliative medicine. She's currently an associate professor at Mount Sinai Hospital with dual appointment in both the Division of Nephrology and the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. She has established an outpatient practice focusing on the care of elderly patients with advanced kidney disease and those with palliative care needs. And she's also the director of the Integrated Nephrology and Palliative Medicine Fellowship. She has a well-established reputation as an expert on communication skills and symptom management in patients with kidney impairment. She has multiple publications and has spoken at several national conferences on these topics. A very warm welcome to Dr. Kinsicki today. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for inviting me today. Um, so today we're going to be discussing decision-making in elderly patients with advanced kidney disease and the role for palliative care. Um, I have no disclosures to report. By the end of today's session, I hope that you will be able to explain the complexities surrounding the chronic dialysis of the elderly patient, to identify patients at high risk of poor outcomes with dialysis, and to utilize a decision-making framework in discussions ab about treatment options of advanced renal disease in older patients. So a perhaps underappreciated fact is that chronic kidney disease in itself is a life-limiting condition. So for example, when you have a 50-year-old with renal impairment or a GFR less than 60, or a GFR less than 60 with some albuminuria, their life expectancy is approximately five to 10 years shorter than a 50-year-old without kidney disease. Now that being said, dialysis is a remarkable treatment, but it will not restore normal life expectancy. In fact, we see the highest mortality in the two months after the initiation of dialysis, making the decision of if and when to start dialysis a very important one. Now previously, there was a dichotomy of thought between palliative care and disease specific or curative care. But there's a new framework of thinking in that palliative care can be provided at any age and at any stage of illness, including alongside disease specific care. And I would argue that given our patients with chronic kidney disease, um, since that they have a limited life expectancy and we know that they have a symptom burden comparable to that of patients living with malignancy, that the utilization of palliative care principles in the care for our patients is essential. So I wanna introduce, introduce you to our first patient of the morning. This is an 89 year old female with a history of a large hepatic cyst, hypothyroidism, pernicious anemia, hypertension, who was referred by her primary care doctor for elevated creatinine. Her son accompanies her to the visit and is very concerned because her primary care doctor told them that mom has stage three chronic kidney disease. He's been researching on Google He's read all about it. He knows that this means that mom is gonna ultimately need dialysis and he wants to know what he needs to start restricting in her diet and what he could do to prevent this. And he's very anxious about it. When you review her labs, you find that her creatinine is 1.15. Her BUN is 32, giving her a GFR of 42. Her electrolytes are otherwise normal. She is not anemic and her urine is without blood or protein. When you go back to trend her labs, you find that going all the way back to 2019, her creatinine has been about the same at a level of 1.19. So the first question I have is, are we overdiagnosing chronic kidney disease in the elderly? Declining renal function is a normal part of healthy aging. Now that being said, 50% of adults over the age of 70 are labeled as having chronic kidney disease, because their GFR is less than 60. So what physiologic changes do we see? As we get older, starting at the age of 40, we find that GFR declines by about six to seven milliliters per minute every 10 years. When we look at autopsy studies or um, studies on transplant donors, we find that with increasing age, there is an increasing number of nephron loss, but without other structural changes, that we would expect to see if there was some type of systemic disease leading to nephron loss. Furthermore, in patients over the age of 70, we find that the majority of patients have a large amount of nephrosclerosis. 
Now, that being said, declining kidney function is a part of aging, but we also know that true chronic kidney disease does exist in this population. We know that older patients are living longer with systemic illnesses like diabetes, that certain vasculitides may present older, um, increased risk of malignancies, and we know that patients who are older are at an increased risk of acute kidney injury, um, often due to medication metabolism differences that we see as we get older. So I think it's time that we redefine what, quote, normal kidney function is and really try to differentiate um, kidney impairment that is related to age-related decline and true chronic kidney disease that will progress. When we look at the mean EGFR level of patients at different ages, we find that there is a declining mean with increasing age. So what actually concerns us when we diagnose someone with chronic kidney disease? Now there's probably numerous reasons, but I'm going to suggest that there's two main reasons. One, we're concerned that their chronic kidney disease is going to progress and that they are going to um, progress to end stage kidney disease and potentially need dialysis, which will affect the quality of their life. And the other concern is that their chronic kidney disease will affect the length or the, the length of their life. Um, you know, what we see is that in younger patients, we find that the level of kidney function at which we start seeing a decreased survival is higher, usually at about 75 milliliters per minute. And in older patients over the age of 65, we find that that threshold is much lower. So until they reach an EGFR of 45, that's the point that we start seeing a change in survival. So here's a question for the audience. Who is least likely to need dialysis in their lifetime? Is it a 40-year-old male with a GFR of 40, a 55-year-old male with a GFR of 30, a 65-year-old male with a GFR of 15, or a 75-year-old male with a GFR of 20? And the answer is the 75-year-old with a GFR of 20. So let's learn a little bit more about um, prognostication. So as we discussed earlier with mortality, different EGFR levels at different ages have different prognostic implications. Now, this was a study of over 200,000 veterans with stage three to five chronic kidney disease that was followed over a three-year period. Almost half of the patients in the study were over the age of 75. And what the authors determined, uh, tried to determine was the level at which GFR was predictive of progressing to end-stage kidney disease. Extrapolated another way, meaning at what level of GFR by age should we start discussing options for renal replacement therapy and preparing patients? And they found that that level ranged based upon age. So for example, we have our first you know, red star here. In patients younger than 44 years old, a GFR less than 45 meant that they were likely to progress to end-stage kidney disease and potentially require dialysis in their life. When you look at our next group of patients, we find that for patients between 65 and you know, 84 years old, it wasn't until the GFR reached about 15 and below that they were most likely to progress to end-stage kidney disease and needing dialysis. GFRs above that, they were more likely to live the rest of their life without ever needing um, to discuss dialysis. And for those oldest patients over the age of 85, um, they were more likely to live out the rest of their life without ever progressing to end-stage kidney disease, regardless of the GFR level. So I think what this means is that we need to start shifting our conversations. We have to start looking at every patient as a whole and not just associating certain labs with a checkbox of what we need to do. Um, meaning we can't plan for dialysis in every patient with a certain GFR level without looking at their age and other factors. We find that 30% of octogenarians with chronic kidney disease die with an unused fistula in their arm, meaning these patients were preparing for dialysis even though they never progressed to end-stage kidney disease. Now that being said, there is somewhat of an unpredictable trajectory. In about 50% of patients over the age of 77 
have an episode of acute kidney injury in the six, six months prior to starting dialysis, which um, causes a more rapid decline in their kidney function. So I think there is still value in referring our older patients to nephrology so we can try to optimize them and lower their likelihood of having an acute kidney injury from preventable causes. But I think we should need to start tailoring our conversations. Instead of asking if somebody would want dialysis, perhaps framing the question more of what if you outlive your kidneys, what kind of treatment would you want then? Now, despite the lower risk of progression, we find that our dialysis patients are aging. Those patients over the age of 75 is the fastest growing dialysis population. Over a 30 year period, this group increased by over 300%. So why is this the case? We find that there's an increasing number of older patients that are being started on dialysis earlier, meaning at higher levels of kidney function than younger patients. So why is this the case? Is it that creatinine and GFR are not as accurate in the elderly and perhaps it's overestimating their kidney function? Could it be that being older with comorbid conditions precipitates symptoms earlier? What I'm going to suggest is I think that we are confusing symptoms of uremia with underlying geriatric syndromes and perhaps inappropriately using geriatric syndromes as a surrogate marker for uremia and using them to make our decision of when to start dialysis. So here's an example of perhaps the most well-described um, geriatric syndrome, which is that of frailty. And as I go through the definition of frailty, I want you to think about the symptoms of uremia that you normally screen for in your patients with kidney impairment. So frailty was initially described in the general population of patients over the age of 65 as meeting at least three of the following criteria, unintentional weight loss, weakness, slowness, sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass, poor endurance or exhaustion, and low activity. Now in the general population, it was found that those patients who met criteria for frailty were at an increased risk of poor outcomes, including declining functional status, increased hospitalizations, and increased mortality. When we look at our chronic kidney disease patients who are over the age of 65, we find that frailty is twice as prevalent as compared to age matched controls without chronic kidney disease. What's also interesting to find is that the syndrome of frailty is not present in only our older patients. We find it across all age groups, including younger patients. Those patients who meet criteria for frailty are started on dialysis earlier, meaning at higher levels of kidney function. But despite this, we find that they have worse outcomes, including hospitalizations and mortality. So I would suggest that for all of our older patients with kidney impairment, we should be doing a geriatric assessment to really establish a baseline to help us determine and monitor them over time of progression of kidney disease to see what is related to underlying geriatric impairments versus uremia. A geriatric assessment would include evaluating their activity of daily living, meaning ability to, to bathe themselves, feed themselves, their instrumental activities of daily living, which is what you need to live independently, like cooking and finances, their mobility, the presence of depressive symptoms, nutritional status, comorbidity, burden, and cognition. When we do these geriatric assessments, we find that most older patients over the age of 65 who are on dialysis have at least two geriatric impairments. Over 50% meet criteria for frailty. 80% require help with at least one IADL. 67% will have cognitive impairment and 33% will have had falls in the last six months suggesting a declining functional status. So looking a little bit more about these geriatric impairments and outcomes, we find that for patients on dialysis, the presence of geriatric impairments is associated with increased risk of hospitalization. For example, patients are at least twice as likely to have hospitalizations if they have impairments in their ADLs, their IADLs, if they have a presence of depressive symptoms, or if they meet criteria for frailty.
In terms of home therapies in our older patients, meaning home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, um, we find that geriatric impairments are also predictive of poor outcomes. Now, in general, approximately 30% of patients will, um, quote, have technique failure of home treatment modalities, meaning that they will need to transition to an in-center hemodialysis in the first two years. Now, typically this is not because the, the dialysis itself is not working well, but rather it's because there's a decline in functional status in either the patient or the caregiver helping with the dialysis modalities. So there was a Canadian frailty study that looked at 109 home dialysis patients, including peritoneal dialysis and home hemo. And they looked at the composite endpoint of technique failure um, and technique failure and death. And they found that for those patients who met criteria for frailty, regardless of the definition of frailty that were used, that they were two times the, the risk of both having technique failure and having technique failure and death. In terms of transplant, our frail patients are less likely to be listed for transplant. If they are put on the waiting list for a transplant, they're less likely to receive a transplant, likely related to an increased risk of waitlist mortality. For those patients who are lucky enough to have a transplant, they are at an increased risk of post-transplant complications. And this can include delirium, delayed graft function, longer like length of stay, increased risk of hospital readmissions, and increased mortality. Now, these three outcomes that we just discussed, hospitalizations, um, technique failure of home modalities, and transplant, um, are all outcomes associated with an increasing number of geriatric impairments. And I would argue that it would be helpful to identify those patients who have geriatric impairments, to identify them at potentially being at risk of poor outcomes and provide an opportunity to intervene on these impairments with either extra support or prehabilitation and potentially improve outcomes. The presence of geriatric impairments at dialysis initiation is also associated with one-year mortality. This was a study of 192 incident dialysis patients who were over the age of 65 and found that increased mortality was correlated with the increased number of geriatric impairments. Those patients that had at least three or more geriatric impairments were almost three times had almost three times the risk of dying at one year as compared to those patients that had a lower number of geriatric impairments. They looked at specific impairments to see which ones were predictive of one year mortality and found that ADL, depressive symptoms and malnutrition were all um, correlated with increased risk of one year mortality. However, the presence of frailty was had the highest correlation. Um, patients who met criteria for frailty had seven times the risk of mortality at one year. So I wanna introduce you to our second patient of the morning. Um, this is Frank. He's an 81 year old male with a history of hypertension, had two strokes over the last year, one of which was followed by a carotid endarterectomy complicated by severe anemia in the setting of a GI bleed a remote history of lung cancer, status post-resection, COPD, GERD, and recently diagnosed, melan recently diagnosed melanoma on his face, which was partially resected, who presented with his wife for evaluation of chronic kidney disease stage five. He endorses that since his stroke, he's had slow ambulation, unsteady gait, and short-term memory impairments. His wife assists him with a lot of activities of daily living, including cooking, and finances. On review of labs, you find that his creatinine is five, his GFR is 10, he is hyperkalemic, has a mild acidosis, and a preserved albumin. When you look at his urine, you find that there's small blood and protein with a protein to creatinine ratio of 1,000, suggesting that there is potentially something systemic that's going on driving his chronic kidney disease rather than an age-related decline alone. <laughs> 
When you review the trend of his labs, you find that he's had longstanding chronic kidney disease stage four for at least the last three years prior that has had a progressive decline. He shares with you that he works as an author and that he feels frustrated by his recent medical setbacks as he's always been very independent. He does not know if dialysis is for him, but his wife thinks that he should pursue it. So when we're met with these encounters, specifically when there's some type of discrep discrepancy or disagreement in treatment options, I find that this four box framework is helpful to help us navigate the decision-making process. We want to review medical indications, patient preferences, quality of life, and any contextual or non-medical features that might um, help patients make decisions. So first let's start with medical indications. Now for Frank, we want to identify the available treatment options, and that includes dialysis and conservative management. We wanna estimate prognosis with both treatments, evaluate risks and benefits, and review any practice guidelines that can help us make medical recommendations. Now, if I was in front of you today, I would be asking for a show of hands to tell me who thinks that sharing prognosis will influence treatment choices. And I imagine that you're all sitting in front of your computers now, raising your hands, saying that you think that this is true. So um, this was a study which interviewed hemodialysis patients that had a predicted one-year mortality of 20% based upon validated prognostic tools. Now, they also interviewed the physicians of those patients um, to ask what they thought the patient's prognosis was. And they looked at prognosis and also transplantation candidacy. So they asked both patients and physicians, do you think that you have a greater than 90% chance of being alive at one year? And what they found were that patients were significantly more optimistic than their nephrologists. 81% of patients said, yes, of course, I think that I have greater than 90% chance of being alive at one year. But the nephrologist thought that was true in only 25% of the patients interviewed. Those patients that had optimistic views on prognosis tended to prefer life extending care. However, more than half noted that if in fact they were seriously ill, that they would want care focused on relieving pain and discomfort rather than extending life. But given this big discrepancy in what the patients think about their prognosis, they're unable to make these informed decisions. This is a second study looking at approximately 1000 dialysis patients. And they were asked, how long would you guess people your age with similar health conditions usually live. Now, 40% of the patients said that they were unsure and didn't answer the question. Of those patients that answered the question, a third said that they thought they had at least 10 years to live. 15% thought that they had between five and 10 years to live. And 11% thought that they had less than five years to live. But when we look at the data, of the average survival of US dialysis patients, we find that the majority of dialysis patients have a life expectancy of less than five years. So again, this is a big discrepancy in what patients think their prognosis is and what their prognosis likely is. In those patients that had prognostic expectations greater than 10 years, um, they were less likely to have documentation of a surrogate decision maker or treatment preferences, and they were more likely, and they were less likely to value comfort over life extension. They were more likely to want CPR or mechanical ventilation. And I'm going to argue that prognostic uncertainty or being overly optimistic regarding prognostic expectations can limit the benefit of advanced care planning if we do not share prognosis with our patients. And this is likely what contributes to the high medicalized and the intensive care patterns that we see at the end of life of our patients who receive dialysis. Now, I can't predict the future. I wish that I could, but um, what I can somewhat predict is who is at a high risk of having poor outcomes on dialysis. And I really think that this is the expectation um, you know, that we should have. We just wanna identify those patients who are at risk of having poor outcomes. So how can we do that? 
we find that our own gestalt um, actually is pretty accurate at predicting this. So the surprise question has been validated in various clinical settings, um, and it's a pretty easy to use tool. It's basically asking yourself, would I be surprised if this patient in front of me died within the next year? Now, um, this was validated in both our chronic kidney disease stage four and five patients and our patients on hemodialysis. Both had prospective studies done in which the providers were asked this question. And in both studies, um, those patients in which the provider said, no, I would not be surprised if this patient died in the next year. Um, those patients were older and they had mo more comorbidities. When we look at overall survival, we find that in the chronic kidney disease stage in four and five group, those patients in the no group had a mortality about five times that in which providers would have been surprised. And in the hemodialysis group, patients in which the provider said that they would not be surprised were about two times as likely to die at one year. Again, suggesting that our clinical judgment is predictive of patients who are at risk of poor outcomes. This was a study of over 400 patients over the age of 67 who were started on dialysis. The majority of these patients were between 65 and 85 years old. And it identified um, four variables that were prognostic of one year mortality. So this first box, um, I hope you can see this, um, looked at age. And this found that in this blue line on the bottom, that those patients over the age of 85 um, had a 70% mortality at one year. This next graph, um, box number B, um, found that comorbid conditions were predictive. In this orange line, those patients that had at least four comorbid conditions had a mortality of 60% at one year. Um, graph number C is our functional status. So the orange line, again, is patients who had ADL dependence and found that these patients had a mortality of 73% at one year. And the last box are those patients who initiated dialysis in the hospital in the inpatient setting. And these patients had a 62% mortality at one year. Now, um, you know, these, th these four factors, age, comorbid conditions, functional status, and setting of dialysis initiation are really like easy to, to get information. So again, um, it's helpful um, in knowing who is at risk of limited survival, which can then frame prognostic expectations and provide more information during your decision-making process with the patients. A more involved um, prognostic model is this Charleston Comorbidity Index. This was a study out of the University of Pittsburgh looking at um, just shy of 300 dialysis patients over a two year period. Now the Charleston Comorbidity Index will assign patients a score and then those scores would be stratified into patients who are low, moderate, high or very high um, risk in terms of their comorbidity status. To get the score, um, patients are assigned one point for every 10 years over the age of 40. So for um, Frank, he would get four points for his age. And then different comorbid conditions are assigned different weights. So for Frank, he has a history of a stroke, has COPD, and also has severe renal impairment, giving him another four points. So his score would be eight, um, putting him in a very high um, comorbidity index. So what the authors tried to determine over this two year period was risk of hospitalizations and mortality. And what they found was that for every unit increase in comorbidity score, there was an increased risk of hospital admissions and an increased risk of mortality. So um, for Frank, who's in the very high comorbidity group, um, he's in this lower bar here, which predicts again, a one-year survival of about 50% on dialysis. The last prognostic model I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing with you mostly because um, they developed an online calculator that you can use to kind of compare, again, your clinical gestalt with what um, the predictive models will predict.
Uh, so this was a study looking to determine six month mortality and looked at 500 patients in both a derivation and a validation cohort. And they identified five independent variables predictive of six month mortality, including increasing age, the presence of certain comorbid conditions, including dementia, peripheral vascular disease, um, a low albumin, and a response of no to the surprise question. Now, if you were to plug in your patient's information into this, you would never ever, ever share the numbers that you receive with a patient or family. Again, this is just providing you information to help identify who is at risk of poor outcomes with dialysis so that you can help frame your discussions with them regarding prognosis. So let's think about Frank for a minute. Based upon his age, he's 81, um, he has comorbidities, he's had, you know, worsening clinical and functional status over the last year. Um, I would say that he's at moderate to high risk of having poor outcomes with dialysis. So what would be the alternative option? The alternative option is conservative management or non-dialysis therapy. Now in 2010, the Renal Physicians Association described conservative management as an acceptable and active treatment in which patients have the right to forego dialysis. Now the language they used to describe this was very intentional because it empowers patients and their families to make this decision for an appropriate and thoughtful management strategy. This is not just what you get if you decline dialysis. So what is conservative management? It's an integrated care model incorporating both palliative care principles and our management of our advanced chronic kidney disease care. So for example, we're going to identify and treat pain and symptoms early. We want to provide physical, psychosocial, and spiritual care, engage patients and families in advanced care planning, and identifying changes in clinical status and increasing care needs and hospice eligibility. While doing this, we are also treating our chronic kidney disease. We are focusing on treating anemia, optimizing fluid status, treating electrolytes, and also making recommendations about nutrition. Now for most patients, dialysis will offer a survival advantage. There are limitations to these studies. Um, first, none of the studies I'm going to discuss, and really I don't think any that are um, available are from the United States. Other countries, including the UK, Canada, and Australia, all have very well established and robust conservative care programs in which they have an interdisciplinary team to help care for their patients. Um, I also wanna preface this by saying that all of these studies that we're going to discuss is focusing on the conservative management of chronic kidney disease. Um, acute kidney injury patients are not included in these studies. Now the median survival that is estimated for conservative management ranges somewhere between six months and a little over one year. So the first question that I have is in regards to intensity of care, can less intense care um, actually be more? And this was a retrospective study that came out relatively recently, looking at over 11,000 US veterans with new incident renal failure. And these veterans received their pre-dialysis care in either a Medicare-based setting or in a VA-based setting. Um, and you know, there's intrinsic differences in the delivery of care um, in these two care models, um, mostly with Medicare being more of a fee-for-service and the VA not. But the outcomes that were looked at were dialysis treatment and death within two years. And what they found was that the frequency of starting dialysis was significantly higher in the Medicare group, um, with 82% of patients starting dialysis compared to 53% of patients starting dialysis in the VA. Now, the notable patient characteristics that were different were that more patients with dementia started dialysis in the Medicare group, more patients with metastatic cancer, and more patients over the age of 80 were started on dialysis in the Medicare group. Overall, um, a total of 47% of patients died within two years. And we found that there was actually a statistically significant higher mortality 
in the Medicare system with 53% um, dying at two years compared to 44%. So this suggests that despite more frequent initiation of dialysis and more intensive care, the patients in the Medicare group were less likely to survive. Um, so perhaps outcomes and survival, you know, are not always as good when we start dialysis in vulnerable patients. When we look at an actual head-to-head -head study, um, this was a study out of the UK, um, which was retrospective looking at four nephrology clinics and identified patients who were over the age of 75 that were estimated to likely need dialysis in the next 18 months. Now, again, this was a multidisciplinary practice. Um, it included physicians, nurses, counselors, and um, psychological support. Um, and they all engaged patients in their pre-dialysis care. And patients were able to opt for either conservative management or dialysis, and they were allowed to change their mind. The endpoint that they looked at was mortality. Now, perhaps not surprising, they found that the dialysis group lived longer. Now, this top um, solid black line are patients who received dialysis. The bottom gray line are those patients who opted for conservative management. At one year, they found that survival was 84% in the dialysis group compared to 68% in the conservative therapy group, and at two years, it was a 76 versus 47% survival. But then the authors looked specifically at patients that had high comorbidity scores, um, defined as having at least three comorbid conditions. And when they looked specifically at those patients, they found that the survival curve the survival curves overlapped, and that survival benefit was not apparent when you controlled for patients with high comorbidity scores, suggesting that patients with high comorbidities, um, dialysis may not offer a survival advantage. They took it one step further and looked specifically at patients that had ischemic heart disease, defined as e either having a history of an MI, anginal symptoms, a positive stress or cath in the past, or ischemic changes on an EKG and found again that in patients with ischemic heart disease, there was no survival benefit in dialysis as compared to conservative therapy. A second study um, from the Netherlands looked at a similar, um, a similar outcome. This was 300 patients all over the age of 70 that had a GFR less than 20. And these patients were actually somewhat matched, so there was no difference in their comorbidity scored. About a third of the patients opted for conservative management. These patients were older and two thirds opted for dialysis. And interestingly, what they found was that in the dialysis group, 40% of patients had either died before the initiation of dialysis or did not progress to end stage kidney disease by the end of the study, which again goes back to our earlier slides um, in terms of who's at risk of actual progression of their chronic kidney disease and that many patients may not progress. So what they looked at were different age groups and also different time points. So the left column looked specifically at patients between 70 and 79 years old. The top dark line is the dialysis group. The bottom dashed line is the conservative therapy group. And regardless of the time point that they looked at, whether it was the time from decision, the time from when their GFR was less than 20, less than 15, or less than 10, dialysis offered a significant survival advantage with the dialysis patients living longer. When they looked at patients who were over the age of 80, they found that regardless of the time point, the survival curves overlapped and dialysis did not seem to offer a survival advantage in these patients. So what are the take home points of these three studies? The first is that in certain individuals, dialysis may not offer a survival advantage. Secondly, in older patients over the age of 75 with high comorbidities or ischemic heart disease, dialysis may not significantly extend life. And in older patients over the age of 80, again, dialysis may not significantly extend life. Now, all this being said, these studies are inherently flawed. There will never be a randomized control trial comparing dialysis to conservative management. Patients are choosing conservative management for a reason. And though we do our best to control for that reason, um, we can't always capture everything. 
even if we control for age and comorbidity, other things like geriatric impairments are not being controlled for. The other things are these studies are looking at mortality, but what other factors do patients and their families value? Again, the take home is that dialysis will offer a survival advantage to most, but it is reduced or non-existent in certain populations. And it's identifying those populations and really engaging them in frank conversations to determine what they value. So when we wanna share with Frank, um, we have to share that uncertainty does exist. You know, given age and other medical problems, I'm worried that you're at a high risk of setbacks and poor outcomes with dialysis, including limited survival. Life may be longer with dialysis, but it's not clear. Knowing that time is short, or time might be short, what is most important when you think about the time that you have left? And Frank notes that the most important thing for him is to not be in pain. He would like to regain some strength and energy, and he wants to be upright. It's important that he can walk and he's not bedridden, and that he's able to think and enjoy time with his family. He continues to work. He was recently awarded this achievement award and was invited to travel overseas to engage in some speaking, uh, public speaking engagements. And he would like to do that. And he would also like to travel with his family. He's worried that dialysis would change what his life looks like day to day and would interfere with his ability to travel. So we wanna look at quality of life. Now, this was a study evaluating health outcome priorities of patients who were over the age of 60 with advanced chronic kidney disease, stage four or five, who were not on dialysis. Um, and it was actually done by one of our faculty, um, Dr. Sarah Raymer, who's now at the Bronx VA. And I think that the findings might surprise some of us. The top health priority that was identified by these patients was actually maintaining independence with 49% of patients ranking that as their top health priority, followed by survival at 35% and then reducing pain and other symptoms. Nearly half of all patients ranked survival or staying alive as their third or fourth health priority. And this is important because it may be surprising to some of us um, what patients might value. And there's no way for us to know what patients value unless we explicitly ask them. So we wanna give an idea of what life on dialysis is going to look like. We know dialysis is three times a week, three to four hours at a time. Some symptoms of uremia might get better with dialysis like nausea, but other symptoms might come. So post-dialysis fatigue, especially in our older patients where you feel very fatigued and really wiped out um, after dialysis sessions is um, one of the main symptoms that people develop. Patients would need a surgery to have an access place and would likely need more than one surgery for maintenance of that. Um, most patients are hospitalized to start dialysis with over a third of patients being hospitalized for at least two weeks for the initiation of dialysis. In the first year after dialysis, we find that on average, patients spend about two months in a facility, facility meaning hospital, rehab, or nursing home, all, all encompassing. Um, we find that increasing age is associated with longer time spent in facilities after um, dialysis initiation, and also the presence of dementia. About 50% of time in that first year after dialysis initiation is spent in either a hospital or rehab or nursing home. The longer amount of time spent in these places is correlated with an increased risk of death. Now, this is probably my favorite study comparing conservative management and dialysis. It was an observational single center study of 200 patients with end-stage kidney disease who were over the age of 70. That selected either conservative management, this top bar, or dialysis, this bottom bar. And again, not surprisingly, it found a survival benefit of about 38 months in the dialysis group compared to 14 months in the conservative management group. But what the authors then looked at was time lost. And that was defined as time spent admitted to the hospital, time spent going back and forth to dialysis, time spent at dialysis, and time spent recovering from that post-dialysis fatigue. And what they found was that though uh, survival was longer in the dialysis group, almost 48% of the days survived was in that time loss category, compared to 4% of days survived in the conservative management group. 
So again, suggesting that though survival is longer with dialysis, what that life looks like is going to be very different between the two treatment options. Frank asks you if dialysis will help improve his functional status. There are several studies looking at this. I'm just gonna show one. And this was a study of 200 patients over the age of 65 that were initiated at dialysis. On dialysis, at the start, almost 80% were care dependent in some way. At six months, 40% had a decline in their functional status, 34% remained stable, 18% improved, and 8% had died. So, you know, unlikely that dialysis will improve functional status. They also found that there was an increasing caregiver burden um, during this time period. Now, I wonder if any of you are surprised to see that there is this declining functional status after the start of dialysis. Um, and if you are, I want to just remind you of the normal disease trajectory, which we see in a lot of our end organ um, diseases, such as heart failure or um, liver failure with advanced cirrhosis or end stage kidney disease on dialysis, where you have this declining functional status and you have a medical event where you're admitted, for example, with a clotted access and you're discharged with a little bit worse off functional status than you came in with. And these repeated medical events with a declining functional status will continue to happen um, you know, for the remainder of the patient's life. So what do we expect to see in terms of patients who are on conservative management and their functional status? Now, this was a very small study, under 50 patients that were conservatively cared for, and it measured their functional status monthly from when their GFR was 15 until they died. And they used the Karnofsky performance score to measure their functional status. And you can see that this disease trajectory is a little bit different than the one I just showed in that patients in the conservative management group tended to maintain their functional status up to the one to two months prior to their death where they had more of a sharp functional decline. So for patients that maintaining functional status and independence is really important to them, perhaps conservative management um, would be something that would be more aligned with their goals. Frank also wants to know if dialysis will improve his cognition. And we know that cognitive impairment is very prevalent in our elderly patients on hemodialysis. Chronic kidney disease in itself, as it progresses, is associated with the declining um, in their cognitive and cognitive status, including executive function. The transition to dialysis is often associated with a significant loss in cognitive function, and we see this more so in hemodialysis rather than peritoneal dialysis. So why do we see this? Um, in a study of older patients on dialysis, they used actually PET-CT um, to look at blood flow before starting treatments, early in their dialysis treatments, and at the end of their dialysis treatments. And they found that during dialysis treatments, there's actually a reduction in their cerebral blood flow by about 10 to 15%. So the thought being that these subclinical, repetitive, hemodynamically induced declines in cerebral blood flow likely causes repeated ischemia and leads to cognitive decline. So the last thing we wanna discuss with Frank is his preferences and identify any contextual features. Now, specifically when we think somebody is requesting a medical therapy, which we think um, is not in their best interest, um, we want to remember that patient-centered care does not mean that we need to blindly follow patient wishes. Instead, we want to understand the reasons behind the patient's request. Is there a misconception about survival or quality of life? Are there other contextual features like family or financial reasons that could be driving the decision? We want to explore hopes and expectations with treatments, identify concerns about the future, and determine any limitations in quality of life or health conditions in which they may consider foregoing a life supporting therapy. Now, Frank was pretty clear by the end of this that he thought conservative management was appropriate for him, but sometimes patients aren't as clear and we need to explicitly define treatment options. So saying something along the lines of some people, you know, wish to live as long as they can and choose dialysis, though they will be at risk of frequent hospitalizations and perhaps less independence. 
Others may wish to focus on quality of their life and prefer treatments that are focused on their symptoms without dialysis, though this mean that life may be shorter. Do you have a sense of how you feel about this? And sometimes it's useful if the patient and family is open to hearing a medical recommendation is to make your medical recommendation based upon a reflection statement of what the patient has told you. So for Frank, it seems like independence is most important to you. And I worry that dialysis would increase the time you would spend interacting with doctors and hospitals and may be detrimental to your quality of life without offering an extended survival. And I think that conservative management best fits with your care goals. And that is what we opted for for him. Um, we discussed referring him for hospice at that time because he did meet criteria as he was declining dialysis with a creatinine clearance of less than 10, but he was not interested in hospice at that time. To follow up the case, um, we pursued conservative management, we continued lab checks, and we optimized many of his chronic kidney disease parameters, um, like his anemia. In terms of symptoms, the two main symptoms that he had was paritis and fatigue, and he was able to travel all pre-COVID, but he went on a three-week trip with his family. They went on this prolonged cruise. He traveled to California. He went to Egypt and England to engage, um, you know, to receive his achievement awards and go on these, um, you know, speaking engagements. And about two years later, he started having new neurologic symptoms, and he was found to have what was presumed to be um, metastasis of the melanoma that had just recently been diagnosed before we met him two years earlier. And at that time, he decided to transition to home hospice, um, and he did pass away with his family around him. So in conclusion, um, the elderly population has unique clinical factors to consider when discussing treatment for advanced kidney disease. Prognostic tools, including age, comorbidity scores, and the surprise question are useful in identifying patients who are at high risk of poor outcomes with dialysis. When we engage in shared decisions, they should be made in which we review medical indications, patient preferences, quality of life, and contextual features. Dialysis may not offer a survival benefit in elderly patients with high comorbidity scores or ischemic heart disease and may not improve functional status or cognitive status. And conservative therapy with concurrent palliative care should be offered to these patients as an active treatment. So um, I wanna thank you again for having me today. If you have any questions about patients or um, about anything that we've discussed, feel free to stop me if you see me or reach out via email. Um, anyone that might be interested in pursuing nephrology as a career or even nephrology palliative care as a career also, you know, please feel free to, to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, that really was terrific. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but please, uh, oh, here's, here's a comment. A very good overview. Oh, uh, thank you. And um, let's wait to see if there are any others. Um, while we're waiting, um, and I think there are a lot of opportunities that your talk raises. One would be for us to look at, um, how often we overcall chronic kidney disease in our elderly patients. Um, and, you know, and, and what, what the ramifications are with, you know, excess testing and- um, Right, and the stress that- Stress and uh, all, all types of things. And I think that's a great opportunity for some work that we can uh, do with, um, with the residents, I think, um, if Dr. Levin agrees. <laughs> Yeah, I think that would be very interesting. It, it, the other thing is, I'm just wondering if um, when, um, when we have a patient that we think might um, be willing to have this conversation, um, are you available to help us have that conversation? Yes, I mean, I'm available. Um, I mean, I'm available definitely on the outpatient side, um, on the Inpatient side, you know, I would be happy to, to help assist. Um, we also have um, 
Dr. Emily Liu, who's not in my, the office right now, um, but she is also chair um, nephrology and palliative care. And I think that, you know, both of us um, have expertise in this area and would be happy to, to help have these conversations. Okay, so a couple of uh, questions have come in. Would you have predicted Frank would live another two years? So I was, um, I wasn't sure. I was surprised um, that he was doing as well as he was doing, um, you know, up until he was diagnosed with the, the metastatic disease. Um, I mean, I had offered them a prognosis of, of probably, you know, months to a year um, when I saw him and I saw the rate of his kidney function decline and um, all of the medical events that were happening. So I was, I was a little bit surprised that he lived two years. Okay, and, and Dr. Dunn is wondering, any data on PD in this population? Um, so PD is, there's some limited data. So, um, you know, some of the, the data we talked about regarding, you know, technique failure, and I think depending on on who the older person is and, and what other comorbidities and functional status they have can be predictive of their um, success. When they've looked at functional status and elderly patients who have started PD, they actually find that same um, decline in functional status after starting peritoneal dialysis. Um, and in fact, a very a, a large number of them have to transition to um, needing either more help at home or transition to a more intense care setting like a, a nursing home or an assisted living. So, um, you know, no, no real head-to-head -head studies regarding peritoneal dialysis and hemo, but there, there are those studies looking at PD in the older patients. Could you comment on home dialysis to any patient that could um, manage that? I mean, I think um, given the appropriate support, um, home dialysis can definitely um, be a, a good option. Um, but the issue is, is that, you know, often they may have an older caregiver as well who are going to, they'll be at risk of having a functional decline. Um, our PD program here actually um, has a kind of unique model in which they have um, peritoneal dialysis at Terrence Cardinal Cook on the inpatient nursing home side. Um, so that, you know, provides an opportunity for patients who maybe doesn't have that support at home. Okay, um, we'll take one more from Dr. Chan. Thanks, Holly. This was a great talk. I agree with we overdiagnose um, CKD3 in our older adults, but we are also under guidance and prompted in EPIC to list CKD as a problem for decreased um, EGFR calculations to reflect the complexity of our patient population, increase the risk score for reimbursement. What are your thoughts? Ooh, that's, that's a toughie. That's a heavy one, <laughs> Dr. Chun. Um, I mean, I think that, again, I think that recognizing that there is impaired kidney function in these patients is important because I think that, um, you know, as I pointed out, a lot of these patients will have an episode of acute kidney injury that will precipitate them to heading towards dialysis. So I think that um, identifying that they have impaired kidney function and focusing on their kidney health and ways to prevent it is very important. Um, but I think maybe framing how we describe it to our patients um, can be done differently. You know, instead of maybe saying you have chronic kidney disease, you have age-related kidney decline that is unlikely to progress, um, but we wanna just optimize your, your overall kidney health. Um, I mean, I think reimbursements and all of that is a, it's a whole nother topic, but I'm not going to get into. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I wouldn't go there. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I think we can all agree we learned a lot this morning. So I hope everybody has a wonderful day and, and stay safe. Thank Take you. Care. You too.